Well, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation, actually, to, to present this afternoon. So my slot um, concerns arguably one of the most important to omics, which is economics. Um, certainly, it has a fundamental bearing on the translation of all the science through to, uh, to practice and to use um, of these newer technologies by the NHS um, in the UK and for further afield, obviously, in other health care settings as well. So I'll just recap on, on some issues that you've, you've probably, you'll, you'll be very familiar with these. Um, one is in relation to the stratified medicine and what it is from perhaps more of an economics perspective. Um, as we see it, it's, the aim is to target patient subgroups through identification of prognostic factors. And these could be as simple as person's age and body weight and these things which are free to measure. Uh, but increasingly, this is mentioned in the context of people's genetic makeup with the intention, obviously, to increase the probability of benefit from treatment or to reduce the probability of harm. But it's important not just to focus on the potential benefits, but what happens to those people who are effectively who test positive and who then require some alternative treatment. <laughs> so stratified medicine also reveals this other patient group who would not necessarily be eligible for the treatment and the targeted treatments, but who would have to go on to second best treatment. So there is a, an issue there that the alternative, the comparative treatment, um, is often more expensive because it's second line treatment, or it may well be less effective than the intended treatment. So some of the economic challenges then facing the evaluation of genetic testing, pharmacogenetic testing in relation to medicine safety and efficacy relate to, uh, first of all, the sharing of the value between the test and the medicine. So if you have a, a, a very innovative test that reveals the patient's um, uh, likelihood to benefit from a treatment, well, should it then be the company manufacturing the test or should it be the company manufacturing the treatment to gain financially or should it be shared? There's currently no mechanism for that. Most diagnostics are co-produced by the developer of the pharmaceutical in the first place, so perhaps it's less important. But as time progresses, um, there will be specific issues about the sharing of the revenues and the value of, um, of particular diagnostics um, together with accompanying medicines. When patient groups are selected, um, that reduces the market share. Um, and so the unit price of the drug must increase in order for the company to make their expected profits. Um, and high cost drugs come with the problem of um, allocation from a, a financially limited NHS. The cost of testing um, is a cost which is spread across the whole population. So in order to prevent perhaps one adverse drug reaction, you may have to test a thousand people, depending obviously on the probability of that adverse drug reaction occurring. So each of the thousand people would incur a cost, but only one patient might arguably benefit. So there is this issue about the population um, costs, as it were, versus individual benefits, and how to balance one against the other in the assessment of cost effectiveness. So the overall cost effectiveness of the treatment strategy must incorporate and consider all these various scenarios. Um, and obviously, the important component is the downstream costs and the benefits which are conditional on the test result. So if somebody were to be tested positive, and then be prescribed a lower dose because a higher dose may otherwise cause an adverse drug reaction, then there'd be perhaps a reduced chance of that person being um, admitted to hospital because of an adverse drug reaction occurring, and so there may be some cost savings. On the other hand, those who test negative um, may well remain on the original intended dose, um, and that might well be effective for them, but it might not, because the test may only determine the avoidance of adverse drug reaction and perhaps not the benefits of the treatment. I will also touch on issues of incidental findings, uh, which is particularly important when, um, when we're testing for, for one allele, let's say, um, using a panel that might give results for many. So you might be um, informed of the importance of testing in relation to one treatment, but the information obtained will relate to many, and that would be information, obviously, for that patient's lifetime. So if we consider a population of patients who would have 
mixed prognosis of benefiting from a given treatment. Um, blue indicates people not benefiting from treatment and the, the, the lighter tone um, indicating treatment, uh, uh, patients who would benefit from treatment. All these patients would need to be tested in order to try to identify those more likely to be benefiting versus not. And if we introduce this um, notion that maybe the majority would test negative, 30% um, in this example would test positive, um, so the test would be able to differentiate those more likely to, um, to respond positively to treatments versus those who test negative. And so the treatments might be directed towards that smaller group with the likelihood that there would be more benefit overall. Obviously, there would be some false positives and false negatives. This person here would be denied treatment, um, even though they would benefit, because the test clearly isn't perfect. And likewise here, there's um, a selection of patients who would not benefit from treatment, even though the test would indicate that they should receive treatment. So we have to calculate the costs and the consequences conditional on the test result. And that allows us to assess the cost effectiveness of targeted treatment. So within health economic evaluation, the main central question is one of opportunity cost. So what is the next best use of a resource, a finite amount of resources in terms of health benefits? So or in other words, does the added value in terms of the gain in health outcome justify the additional cost? Now benefits in health economics, certainly in, in the UK, are typically measured as quality is the quality adjusted life year. And that's the currency of interest and the preferred currency used by NICE for its decision making on the cost effectiveness of interventions. And qualities are a composite measure of both quality of life and quantity of life. It's the, it's the integrated area under the curve, if you like, of quality versus quantity of life. And if you're able to improve qualities by using an effective medicine or any other health technology, then you would be um, gaining qualities. Health economic evaluation um, normally considers costs from the perspective of the payer. So in the UK, that would be the NHS. So out-of-pocket costs by patients um, would not generally be considered, but there may be some, some exceptions to that rule. In the calculation of cost effectiveness, what we do is calculate the difference in costs between the um, routine care um, versus the pharmacogenetic guided care. So the difference in costs of one versus the other divided by the difference in benefits. And if the benefit is measured in qualities, then we arrive at an incremental cost-effectiveness ratio. If the incremental cost-effectiveness ratio is somewhere below 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality, then NICE would judge that to be cost-effective use of resources. If the incremental cost-effectiveness ratio exceeds that value, then the treatments would normally not be recommended for use. There are, again, some exceptions to the rule. Um, so certain treatments towards the end of life, typically treatments for cancer, the threshold will go upwards, maybe to £50,000 per quality. And treatments for certain rare diseases may go upwards to, to maybe £100,000 per quality. So my focus of the talk is in relation to the prevention of adverse drug reactions. It's where my research has been, um, been, been happening in, in the last few years. Um, and the recent um, article by Munir P. Mohammed and others um, suggests that between 20 to 30% of adverse drug reactions could potentially be prevented by pharmacogenetic testing. However, very few genetic tests are currently used in clinical practice. And a review identified that maybe 20 genes that affect approximately 80 medicines have been shown to be actionable in the clinic. So it's a very small proportion of all medicines and all potential targets. So it's still a relatively um, immature um, clinical application of diagnostic testing, um, but nevertheless, it, it's gaining some traction. This is the typical framework for assessing the cost effectiveness of a pharmacogenetic test aimed at um, reducing adverse drug reactions. So you would have the comparison here of the pharmacogenetic guided treatment against standard treatments. So this would be the, the decision to be made whether to invest in one or the other. And if you were to um, go down this pathway of the pharmacogenetic guided treatment, there may be a test result indicating a variant genotype or a test result with, with wild, uh, wild genotype. And consequent to that, um, there would be an alternative treatment strategy. 
um, with the probability of a patient experiencing an adverse drug reaction or not. Um, if they do, there's a probability of them remaining alive or a smaller probability you would hope of them not remaining alive. Um, and likewise, if, um, if, if patients were to test positive for this variant genotype, whatever it might be, um, then it might well be a false positive test and there would be a, a smaller chance of an adverse drug reaction and consequences further down the line. If patients were to test negative, then they would continue with whatever would be prescribed as the variant genotype um, treatment strategy in the case of false negative test and a wild type um, genotype um, treatment strategy in the case of, of a, correct false, a correct negative test result. And likewise, this would be replicated for the standard treatment. And when you calculate the costs and the outcomes over a defined period of time, then you can assess whether, in fact, a pharmacogenetic test proves to be cost-effective compared to a st standard treatment. So I'll run through a couple of examples of work that we've done recently. The first being cabamazepine, which is a treatment used first line um, in epilepsy. Unfortunately, it causes adverse drug reactions in about 5% of, of patients, and these include uh, macropapular exanthema, ME, uh, which is a mild rash uh, which resolves spontaneously upon discontinuation. It doesn't have a major impact, um, some patient discomfort, um, but then that resolves. But then progressing from that might be hypersensitivity syndrome, which is more serious. Um, initially initially uh, presents as a rash, but then that progresses to fever, eosinophilia, hepatitis, nephritis, um, and that's associated with a level of mortality, 10% uh, mortality. At the more severe end of the spectrum, is the Stephen Johnson syndrome and the toxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, and that is a, is a very, um, it's a life-threatening adverse drug reaction, which is associated with um, a potentially 50% mortality um, over, um, over a period of a few months, with long-term lasting um, health uh, problems as well. Thankfully, it's very rare, one in 10,000 with cabamazepine. Now, um, going back a few years, the HLA-B1502 allele was identified to be associated with SJS um, in Han Chinese and Thai populations. And the label for cabamazepine in these countries is for individuals should be screened before um, being treated. More recently, the HLA-A3101 um, allele is, was found to be associated with hypersensitivity reactions to cabamazepine in European and Japanese populations. And the presence of the allele increases the risk of these cutaneous adverse drug reactions from 5% to 26%. There's a five-fold increase in the risk in the presence of the allele, whereas the absence of the allele reduces the adverse drug reaction from 5% to 3.8. So testing European patients may well be a worthwhile therapeutic strategy. And we tested to see whether that was cost-effective as well. So we assessed this uh, from an NHS perspective. Um, the testing itself is a two-part test. The first part is for A31, and there's a 50-pound cost to that test. The second part, for those testing positive, um, are then looking to see whether it is um, 3101, and there's a 90-pound cost associated with that second test. That might seem to be peanuts. It, it's not a huge total cost, 150 or thereabouts pounds per patient. Um, but then if you appreciate that, you have to perhaps test several thousand patients to avoid that one adverse drug reaction, given the prevalence being one in 10,000, then it soon scales up. In our model, we assume that patients who do test positive would receive lamotrigine, which is an alternative anti-epileptic drug. This is the economic model, similar to the one I showed earlier, where you have a patient who is newly diagnosed with epilepsy, um, and then the standard treatment is current day practice, which is not to test, and they may experience no adverse drug reaction, a mild rash, hypersensitivity syndrome, or SJS or 10, and based on those, there'd be conditional outcomes of how they survive and which alternative treatments they may receive. Patients who do test for um, HLA-3101 um, may test positive, in which case they receive lamotrigine, or they test negative, in which case they continue with carbamazepine, and obviously there's a probability of adverse drug reactions associated with both these treatments. 
This model um, also incorporates the effectiveness of the treatments on epilepsy, because people switching to lamotrigine, which may be second best to carbamazepine, may well have less well-controlled epilepsy, and it's important to incorporate that in the evaluation as well. So these are the results. Um, these are, this is for a typical 38-year-old male experiencing, on average, 12 seizures per year, and you can see that the average cost per patient um, differs over a lifetime. These are lifetime costs projected over a lifetime, differ by only 300 pounds. So it's a very small difference to a pharmacogenetic guided strategy versus a standard care strategy. And the number of qualies gained um, over a lifetime um, differ by only 0 0.02. When you divide those two figures one by the other, you, you, you identify a, a cost effectiveness ratio of 12,800 pounds which is below the, 12, sorry, below the 20,000 pound per quality threshold, and so testing would be cost effective. But note that the, the benefits over a population are tiny, um, only eight quality adjusted days over a lifetime. It's because all the benefits are effectively in the one or two people out of the 10,000. But from a health economics perspective, the investment from the NHS is to test everybody and then the likelihood of testing positive and experiencing an adverse drug reactions has to be factored into the analysis. So then there's a dilution of the effect. There might be a big effect in one person, but it's diluted over many. If we incorporate the uncertainty around this estimate, we can present it on a cost-effectiveness acceptability curve, which plots the probability of testing being cost-effective for different thresholds willingness to pay. So if NICE suggests that £20,000 per quality is its threshold willingness to pay, then testing has about an 80% probability of being cost-effective. So there's good likelihood of testing for carbamazepine um, being cost-effective. So the conclusion from the health economic analysis was just that, that testing of patients in European descent would be cost-effective use of NHS resources. But the summary of product characteristics um, remains the fact that there is insufficient data supporting the recommendation for routine screening in these populations. So my second case study relates to allopurinol. Allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, um, standard urate lowering treatment for long-term management of gout. Um, it's prescribed by the bucket loads by the NHS. Um, it's very cheap, it's been around for, for several decades, uh, but again, it's associated with the same adverse drug reactions of SJS and 10. Um, in this case, the, 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 the probability of those adverse drug reactions occurring is somewhat higher, um, 7 in 10,000 patients. And uh, pharmacogenetic association studies have identified the HLA B5801 as being a strong predictor of these adverse drug reactions with an odds ratio of, of nearly 100 um, the HLA B5801 allele is present in about 15 to 18% of certain Asian populations, but it's very rare, only 1% to 2% in European populations. So the question is whether um, genotyping would be cost effective in, an, in, a, in a UK setting where obviously the, the predominant population is from a European descent. Um, it isn't routinely recommended by the FDA or the European Medicines Agency. Um, it, there is evidence to suggest that it is cost-effective in populations from Thailand and Korea. Um, however, it remains to be the case that there is um, compelling evidence in the UK setting. So we set about to construct an uh, economic model of allopurinol and pharmacogenetic testing. And the decision tree analysis, um, again, was over a lifetime because we wanted to know the lifetime impacts of experiencing these adverse drug reactions as well as the impact of managing gout with a potentially inferior treatment. And so the decision here was to either test for B5801, those testing positive would receive an alternative xanthine oxidase inhibitor for Buxostat, which is more expensive by far, or alternatively, if they test negative, then they would be safe, in inverted commas, to receive allopurinol. Standard of care um, is for everybody to receive allopurinol. And the results um, are indicated here in this rather busy slide, but if I can just focus your attention on the final two columns about the incrementals. This is a difference in cost and a difference in qualities between 
a genetic strategy versus standard care, um, it suggests that the quality gains, average quality gains is 0.002, again, of the same order of magnitude as we saw with the carbamazepine. The difference in costs overall, 103 pounds, are entirely down to differences um, between costs in, in the genotyping itself, the cost of the testing, and the additional cost of treating patients with the more expensive fibroxostat. So overall, the incremental cost-effectiveness ratio in this case was just short of £45,000 per quality, and that would not deem to be cost-effective. And one of the reasons for that is that the numbers needed to screen in order to avoid one case of um, SJS or 10 in this population would be more than 11,000. So you'd have to multiply the 11,000 by the cost of the test, which is 50 pounds, in order to prevent one adverse drug reaction. So our findings then from this study was that the prospective genotyping for B5801 prior to prescription of allopurinol um, for gout is not cost-effective uh, use of NHS resources. But we did find by looking at different subgroups and different further analyses that in certain populations, so for instance, people with chronic renal insufficiency who are at a higher risk of adverse drug reactions or patients from an Asian descent, there'd be more likelihood for it to be cost-effective. If we reduce the cost of genotyping, then the cost-effectiveness falls below the £30,000 per quality threshold. And if we wait a couple of years until such time as Fibuxistat is available generically, and its price would reduce dramatically, again, that brings down the, the ISA to, to the range of being cost-effective. If we had both a reduction in the cost of the testing and of the alternative drug, then it would become cost-effective. So I'll just focus in on a couple of issues, a couple of observations. The first being the magnitude of benefits, and I've already alluded to the fact that the actual average population benefits of pharmacogenetic testing are extremely small. These are between 1 and 17 quality-adjusted days over a lifetime. Okay, so that's one thing to note. Second thing to note is that um, cost-effectiveness of routine pharmacogenetic testing uh, has not been demonstrated in many cases. The example here of allopurinol not being cost-effective is just one of these. And the reason is because these serious adverse drug reactions, thankfully, are rare. That alternative prescrip prescription medicines may be less effective or more expensive. That the mean quality gains are small, as I've already mentioned. But that the costs are distributed across many. The other complication issue is that the cost-effectiveness threshold set by NICE for, um, for, for prevention in the context of, of, um, of, of our pharmacogenetic testing is in the range of 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality, as I've already mentioned. But often drugs which are indicated for very rare conditions, um, and these are identifiable individuals, they don't need to go through the process of screening to be identified, the cost effectiveness threshold is between 100 and 300,000 pounds per quality. So there's inconsistency here. You have a rare, two rare conditions, one through an adverse drug reaction and one through the disease itself being rare, uh, but NICE applying different thresholds for cost effectiveness. So we heard earlier about Ivacafta, uh, which costs £180,000 per patient per year for the remainder of their lives, um, being reimbursed by the NHS, and it's because it fell um, below this level of threshold um, and was deemed to be cost effective. The other complication is in relation to the discount rate. This is used in economic evaluations to, um, for, for future costs and benefits to be related to net present value. So for health technologies, including new medicines, the discount rate is 3.5% per year. And that has the impact of reducing um, £100,000 incurred in 10 years' time to a net present value of £15,000. You can talk to me later about the mechanics of this, but just accept my word for now. Public health prevention interventions, such as I don't know, brushing teeth for children and so on, has a, um, a discount rate of 1.5%. So it's a lower discount rate, which means that the net present value is much higher, £45,000. And recently it was announced that for patients who, um, who are harmed because of some... Um, negligence through the NHS, they would receive compensation at a negative discount rate, minus 0.75%. So in actual fact, 
their £100,000 in 10 years' time is equivalent to £150,000 today. So we've got varying and contrasting um, methodological um, issues here in relation to the cost-effectiveness of interventions in the NHS generally, but specifically to pharmacogenetic testing. Yes, it is a health technology, but it's also a prevention in relation to adverse drug reactions. And it's also, to some extent, it's preventing the, an adverse drug reaction, which is a consequence of, obviously, medical intervention. So if that um, drug was used um, off-label, for instance, then there's potential claims of the grounds there for, for compensation. So it's, it's very unclear where, in this spectrum of discount rates, um, genetic testing ought to be. Right, I'll quickly go through this, which is the obvious, really, that testing for one allele using a diagnostic panel for many has the potential to discover incidental findings. So, for instance, these are the CYP, uh, cytochrome P450 isozymes, um, which are associated with adverse drug reactions to these particular products. This lists the adverse drug reactions. So, if a clinician were to prescribe warfarin and wanted to know somebody's 2C9 status, and then um, requested a test, a panel test, then that would reveal the results for all these different isozymes. So if that patient were to later want clopidogrel, then the information would be at hand. So the cost effectiveness shouldn't be assessed in isolation. It should be assessed across the board. And if you extrapolate this to whole genome sequencing, then one test, maybe it would, it would be ordered for a particular reason, but it would have far greater lifetime benefits and value. So just to summarize, evidential standards. Um, I don't think there's a level playing field at the moment. Um, the evidence in the context of rare events is, is somewhat different um, in terms of treatment of that rare events versus prevention of rare events. The comparative effectiveness and cost of alternative courses of action um, are largely unknown. Um, so long-term follow-up studies haven't been done. There is a nice reference case for methodological um, approaches, but I put a tick against it. Perhaps that should be a question mark. There are some aspects of the methods which perhaps don't fit, uh, are not fit for purpose. And there's an issue about equity, whether a quality is a quality is a quality, which is a mantra of, of health economists. Um, so should a quality lost because of isogenic harm be valued the same as a quality lost through secondary degree burns? I would suggest perhaps not. So I'd just like to finish, um, first of all, by um, acknowledging partners and collaborators over the years, um, but also a, a plug that the Academy of Medical Sciences will be issuing a report on pharmacogenetics in a couple of weeks' time, and for you to be uh, mindful of, uh, of that as and when it comes. Thank you.